The Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. We offer respect to the Métis and all who have lived on this land and made Lethbridge their home. So today we have Dr. Katharina Stevens, um, who has worked in the ethics of argument for seven years. That is, that is a real feat. She's an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Lethbridge, where she holds a board of governors research chair on the ethics of, arg of argumentation. She's also a co-editor of the argumentation journal Informal Logic. Amazing. She's developing a non-ideal role ethics for argumentation and a textbook on ethical arguing and has published in Virtues of Argumentation and the Role of Adversatility in Argument. We all need this. Please listen closely and please give some support to Dr. Stevens as she comes and presents. Hi. Uh, oh, can you? Okay, let, let's stand somewhere where you can't hear me breathe. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a it's a great honor. You can, yeah. Now you better. Okay. So this is where I will stand. Um, it's a great honor to be allowed to speak to SECPA, which is an amazing organization. Um, so today I want to talk about charity, but like not the one where you give money, the one where you give attention. Um, so what does it mean to be charitable when we argue? So um, disagreement of all forms is uncomfortable. And I don't just mean like political disagreement, like we disagree with people about like heavy topics like the permissibility of abortion, what to do with climate, climate change, but sometimes we also just disagree about like what do we do about the thing that our sister said, right? Is it her fault? Is it my fault? Is it our brother's fault? Like disagreement in general is uncomfortable, especially when it's about something that's really important to us. And um, when we must argue with those who we disagree with, um, then we could feel ourselves becoming hostile. I do, like all the time. And the moment we feel that, we start kind of having this urge to treat their arguments or the things they say unfairly. Let's try and resist the impulse to think, no, yeah, that's true of other people, but I don't. I always treat everyone fairly. I always listen. Um, this is really unlikely because our brains are hardwired to pick out of a bunch of information that piece that agrees with what we already think. Like, this is such something that, um, Neuroscience tells us our brains are really good at finding the bits of information that tell us that we're right, and they're really good at suppressing everything that tells us that we're wrong. So it's not our fault that we treat other people's arguments unfairly, it's biology's fault. That's just how we're made. And so instead of trying to kind of resist that, we can just be like, yeah, I'm a horrible person. What do I do about that? That's how I approach the world. Hi, I'm a horrible person. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> so, so, I don't know if you've ever taken a critical thinking class, but we make a lot of students at the University of Lethbridge take introduction to critical thinking classes. And one of the things that you find in almost every critical thinking textbook is at some point you have like about half a page, half a page of about 500 pages, is about the principle of charity. And. Um, the principle of charity basically says that when someone else gives you an argument and you try to figure out what they just told you, um, there, and you could understand it in different ways, some of which are better and some of which are worse, you're supposed to understand them as a good argument rather than a bad one, even if your first impulse is to think this is a really bad argument. Right, so like you see that picture, someone says to you, I think we should put one of those in our pond. That would be a great addition. You see the rabbit and you're like, why would you want to drown a bunny? Maybe you should think further until you can see the duck. Yeah, it's a joke, you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> okay. 
So what most of these books say about the principle of charity may make it appear as if this is a really useful and straightforward principle, right? So look at what they say. They say things like, the principle of charity says that whenever we find someone's meaning unclear, we should attempt to interpret it in a way that makes sense. Or the principle also states that one should try to give the most charitable reading to someone's argument by filling in implicit elements of the argument and giving the speaker the benefit of the doubt. Really straightforward, like we know what that's supposed to mean. But sometimes when you read these books carefully, you find like just the tiniest hint that maybe things aren't that easy and there should be more than half a page. So this one has, Charity, principle of, interpreting arguments or positions adopted by others in the best possible light, and then it says a whole bunch of other stuff, and then it says, the appropriateness of this depends entirely on context. And then it doesn't really explain how you're supposed to figure out the context. It just is like, okay, now go on. When we look into the scholarship that is there on argumentation and critical thinking, then we soon find out that actually the principle of charity among people that think about it is really, really controversial because no one actually knows what is required and people are not really sure whether it's a good idea in the first place. On the one hand, you'll find things like the principle gets defended as morally required, like we should do this to be good people, um, epistemically valuable, which basically means it helps us find good reasons and gain knowledge, um, prudential and advisable to the interpreter, like, it's a good idea for you to do this for yourself. But then on the other hand, you get arguments that say that the principle should be rejected, like we shouldn't be charitable, because it creates moral harms and because it precludes access to insight and knowledge and serves us poorly. So there's like, you know, you go into the textbooks, there's half a page on this, you're like, easy, finally something we don't disagree on. And then it turns out we disagree on this too. So, I put the question to you. Is charity during arguing an essential valuable norm? Or is it morally reprehensible and dangerous? Should we keep teaching it to our students? Should you be charitable when you argue with your sister about the thing your brother said, or shouldn't, shouldn't you? Which arguments are the good ones? The one for or against charity? Now, Here's what I think, all of these arguments are good ones. I use the principle of charity, they're all good. Um, the arguments for and against charity are good, but they are not all about the same thing. Like when we say you have to be charitable when, when someone is arguing with you, there can be several different things we mean. And the, all these arguments apply to some of these things, but not to others. So basically what I'm trying to work out is this appropriateness depends on context. What does that mean? There can actually be two different kinds of charity we can give someone when they're arguing with us. And both of them can sometimes be required and sometimes they're just okay, it's okay to do it or not. And sometimes they're harmful and we really shouldn't do this. And often, in order to be truly charitable, we need to apply both, one after the other. If we just do one, we, we do one of those morally harmful things. At, at least that's what I want to convince you of, so please use charity for the remainder of the talk. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. First, I have already talked about what argumentative charity is. Then I'm kind of talk about what, like, what you see when you go and read what people have written about this, right? First, what reasons do they give for being charitable? And then what reasons do they give against being charitable? And then we'll reach a point at which we're all horribly confused, because I hope that you'll agree with me that all these arguments are kind of good. Um, and then I'm gonna try and convince you that there are two different kinds of charity and I'm gonna call them etic and emic charity and I've stolen those terms from the anthropologists. I went down the hallway, asked an anthropology professor if I could and she said I could but I can't tell anyone her name. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll talk about advantages and risks of etic charity, advantages and risks of emic charity and then how we should put them together and deal with them when we actually have to argue with someone. And then you can disagree with me and tell me why I'm wrong. 
So we've already done the first, now we're at the second. We're going to talk about the reasons you can get for being charitable. Um, so, right, you might think, look, it's hard. I, like, I hear an argument, it's obviously bad. It's hard to be charitable to it. And also, being charitable, charitable to someone I disagree with probably makes it harder for me to get what I want. It would be much easier to just show them why, why they're stupid and move on with my life. So why should I do this thing? The main arguments for charity, there's a prudential argument, as in an argument for why it's actually good for you to do this, an epistemic argument, an argument for why if you do this, you're gonna get more knowledge, understand things better, and so on, and a moral argument, that I have cut the conceptual argument, so I'm sorry about that, a moral argument that says why you owe it to other people. And all of these you can find in these textbooks. So textbooks are really good at giving you the pro arguments. So this one, this textbook has in it the prudential argument, the why is it good for you? And it says, another reason to adopt the principle of charity is that it will help you refute your opponent's claims. If you are not aware of your opponent's reasons, how can you respond clearly and forcefully? The idea basically is, someone gives you an argument, you criticize it as you hear it, they meant it to be much better, then they can just change it and then you have to criticize it all over again and you've just embarrassed yourself. You don't want that, so you kind of preemptively interpret it charitably, then you can defeat it more thoroughly. That's the idea. So it's good for you to be charitable because you win, you win a more thorough victory that way. The so-called epistemic argument is in this textbook. In addition, just because a person disagrees with you does not mean her argument must be bad. It might turn out that an opponent's argument for a claim that you don't accept is much better than your own argument for an opposing claim. So here the idea is something like you want to be charitable because in the end what you want is knowledge and the truth. And it might just be that you're wrong. And because our brains are wired to always find the reasons why we're right, we have to kind of work hard against that so that we get to knowledge and that requires us to try and be charitable when people offer us reasons against what we already believe. So that's a pretty good one. And then there's the moral argument, right? That's in here. It's the fair thing to do and it's the thing that most likely to aid in clear communication. And when it comes to criticizing someone else's argument, you want to be especially fair in stating what you think their argument is. So here the idea is kind of like, if someone takes the time to explain to you how you're thinking, you kind of owe it to them to try and actually understand what they mean instead of, you know, pouncing on the first opportunity to show them why they're wrong. It's a moral obligation, it's just mean to try and show them that they're wrong before you've really tried to understand why they might be right. So those are the reasons, the main reasons people give you for being charitable. Uh, and you can find them all in these critical thinking textbooks. They're usually there in that half page. But there are also reasons against being charitable. Right? So you might think, okay, these are, these are very obvious, good reasons. We have to be charitable when we disagree and argue. But actually, um, charity can be harmful, both morally, like you can do bad things to people by being charitable to them, and they can be harmful for getting knowledge or insights or understanding. First of all, charity can distort the argument that you're interpreting, and second of all, for like asking someone else to be charitable can be used against the, uh, as a weapon against that person. Right, because you make them look like they're being me mean-spirited or stupid and then they can't deal with it or their objections are being interpreted in a bad light. So charity can be used in bad ways. What's happening? Oh, wrong button. I'm not that good with technology, obviously. Two buttons and I get the wrong one. All right, so the first, let's look at the why charity can distort the interpreted argument. There's something that the philosopher Trudy Govier, who has taught at the University of Lethbridge for a long time, um, has called toxic charity. So the interpreter 
tries to make the argument better, but because they're stuck in the way that they see the world, they thereby twist it into something that the argue wouldn't even recognize as their argument anymore. So like, let's go back to the duck rabbit head thing, right? Let's say this person says, I think we should put one of those in our pond. That would be a great addition. And then this guy, he's like, this is clearly a rabbit, but I'm supposed to be charitable. So let's figure out how I can bring pond and rabbit together. Oh, she must mean a swamp rabbit. She wants to buy a swamp. You, those you can't buy, but that's a better argument than trying to drown a normal bunny, right? So if you, you can use charity and accidentally end up making the argument worse. So first of all, this kind of is bad morally speaking, right? The, she didn't get her point across, right? If the point of charity is to help get someone get their point across, this does not do it. It actually makes it harder for her to get her point across. So you basically take the voice away. And this has a political dimension that I want to kind of just quickly remark on. Namely, sometimes we do this with minority groups, right? When minority groups have a point, we try that is very foreign to us. We try to kind of integrate it into the way we see the world. We're like, oh, they must mean this. This makes sense in my worldview. And then what they say kind of becomes part of the mainstream. And the part that they were trying to say that's really different from the mainstream gets lost because we've now incorporated it. And that feels really cozy and good. And so they don't manage to say anything at all that changes anything. We, we, we tend to do that. I tend to do this a lot. That's why I noticed because I'm a bad person, as I mentioned, right? And we, um, and we kind of tend to do this thing because that makes us feel good, right? Because then we can tell ourselves, oh, you're such a good person, you were charitable, and also now I don't have to deal with anything that's truly challenging, right? The argument, I was good to you, the argument fits in my worldview, everything is fine. So there's a real trap there. The other problem that comes when we engage in toxic charity is that we can, right, on the one hand, we can do something bad to the arguer. On the other hand, we can also just lose the insight or knowledge we could have gained if we had actually interpreted the argument according to what the arguer was trying to do. Right, so a duck would be a nice addition to the pond, but that guy will never figure that out because he was charitable in the wrong way. So we can lose this kind of insight. Um, and we can lose it either because we accidentally make the argument worse by trying to be charitable, or we could do it because we make it much, we actually end up making it better, but in the end we lose out like wrestling with a very strange viewpoint that would have been hard to integrate and made our own thinking better. The other way that um, charity can generate harms is if we try and force someone to be charitable who is in argument with someone else. So let's imagine we have two people and they're arguing about something and someone makes an argument and the other one brings an objection, right? Uh, someone says, um, your sister did this and it was wrong of her and the other one says, no, it wasn't wrong because. Now, if I interpret the first person charitably, then the result will be that I tell the second person that they got this wrong and that their objection was wrong. Does that make sense? Like if you have, if you're a third person using charity for one, between two who are disagreeing, you have to be uncharitable to the other. You can't be charitable to both. It's what someone called, named Lewinsky calls the paradox of charity. Like if it's a triangle, you're gonna have to choose. You choose sides. And so demanding charity of this person um, means assuming that their objection was bad and that you're uncharitable to them, right? And this can be a moral harm. You can basically say, look, we're not going to give you a voice. Your objection doesn't count. We don't have to listen to it because you don't understand what this person is saying in the first place. And that can be really hurtful and painful. And second, again, you can just lose access to knowledge or insights because now you're not listening to this objection and maybe it was a good point. Okay, so now we know reasons against being charitable. What do we do about this? The thing that I find so confusing or that I found so confusing when I read this literature was basically that I think that all these arguments are good. So charity is morally good and useful for gaining knowledge and charity is morally bad and bad for gaining knowledge. This is not a good place for a philosopher to be in, so I need to get out of it. 
So maybe we just do this, something that we always do when we deal with these kinds of things. We say charity is a, charity is a valuable tool, but we have to figure out when to use it, right? Sometimes it's appropriate and sometimes it's not. And that's usually a good response, but here's something that's weird about this. And you might have had this feeling too when I was talking about toxic charity and all of these things. It feels like many of the harms that charity cause are actually harms that could be interpreted as the harms of being uncharitable, right? The toxic charity doesn't feel really charitable, does it? Think about toxic charity. Isn't the decision to change an argument from someone else so that it's good from my point of view instead of doing the labor of understanding what they actually mean uncharitable rather than charitable? But then on the other hand, when you just understand what the arguer means, but you don't try and figure out how that might fit into your point of view, that's also not really charitable because people offer you arguments because they want to change your point of view, not because they want you to kind of have a nice story about their life and the way their mind works, right? So it looks like there's some kind of tension here. The, the arguments against charity work, but they seem to work by pointing out that this is uncharitable behavior. So what do you do about that? I can't help with it, but think that there are really two kinds of charity, and the interpreter's task is to kind of find out which one to use when and how much of it. An argument can be interpreted charitably, either so that it's good from the interpreter's point of view, so from my point of view, or it can be interpreted charitably in a way that makes accessible to the interpreter, to me, why it's good from the arguer's point of view, what you really mean. There's ethic argument of charity and emic argument of charity. So ethic and emic come from anthropology. When you do ethic research, you go and you observe someone else's culture through the lens of how you see the world. When you do emic research, you try and immerse yourself in the culture until you understand how they see the world. That's where I stole this from. Again, Jody said I shouldn't say her name. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Ethic argumentative charity says, make the argument good from your point of view or from a chosen audience's point of view, right? So if I use ethic charity because I want Sam's argument to be convincing to you, I would find out what you all think and then twist Sam's argument until you like it. It's I directed at identifying good reasons from the interpreter's worldview, not understanding what the arguer really meant. And then emic argumentative charity is meant to make understandable why the argument is good from the arguer's point of view. It's directed at identifying the way the world works from the arguer's point of view in order to figure out how the argument could appear to them to give a good reason. So let's talk about the advantages and risks of all because of these two kinds, because I think you'll see very quickly that all these arguments kind of fall for, are for one or for the other and so on. Okay, so first of all, you might have thought, okay, that settles it. Attic charity is bad and emic charity is good, right? You might think that the arguments that I've shown you kind of clearly favor the emic charity, like the understand how it looks like from the arguer's point of view type of charity, because the majority of objections seem to target the other type. But there are advantages to ethic charity, to trying to make the argument good from your or your audience's point of view. First of all, sometimes the prudential argument, the it's good for me argument, is actually really weighty, right? Imagine you want to convince an intelligent audience that someone's worth listening to, then it might be good to show them why their argument would have something to tell to them. Second, using ethic charity to offer an arguing, argument um, that's a version of their own that can convince you might help them, ha might help you understand each other better and give you pathways to come to kind of some kind of compromise, right? They give you an argument that you can't accept as it is and then you mirror it back to them in a way that you could understand that makes sense to you and that helps them understand your worldview and in this way you can somehow work yourself to a point where you can come to compromises or figure out how the other things. So it can be really valuable to increase communication. And then also, in the end, people offer arguments so that others recognize new reasons. So at some point, you're going to have to try and fit an argument into your worldview, right? 
So some attic charity at some point seems to be required, even if first you should do the emic stuff. At some point, you have to say, okay, now how does that fit with me? But like being purely attic charity is risky, right? The more different the person is from you, the more different they see the world than you do, the more um, it kind of turns into toxic charity if you're just doing the attic thing. And toxic charity is harmful, especially if the reason offered by the interpreted argument, as it was meant by the arguer, would in fact be good if you could just understand it. And further, it's hardly ever acceptable to just demand attic charity from someone who's kind of objecting to something because it asks them to twist an argument into something that they can't object to anymore and that seems unfair. So let's look at the advantages and risks of emic charity. Emic charity seems to have all the advantages, right? Emic charity is the one where you try to understand what the argue really means. Um, it aims at gaining understanding of why the argument is good from the arguer's point of view and therefore it ensures that the arguer actually gets a voice, that you're actually listening to what they're saying. It also helps you gain access to their reasons and therefore gets you new insight and new understanding. And even if you determine that in the end the person you were talking to didn't have a good reason, right now you know more about your own position. That's a kind of famous million argument. Even when, when you deal with objections you don't agree with, dealing with them will give you a better idea of what you believe and why you believe it. But there are serious risks associated with emic charity too because it has its own toxic version. If you use emic charity on someone without in the end turning to the ethic part where you say, now how does this relate to my mind, you're basically just psychologizing them, right? You're like, oh, you just believe that because you had a hard childhood. I can totally understand why if I had a hard childhood like you, I might think that, but me being a rational and fully functioning person, I would never believe that. Like if someone says that to you, I'm pretty sure you're gonna be upset, right? That's emic charity by itself. If you don't, in the end, ask how does this actually say something to me, that's what you've basically done. Additionally, emic charity requires you to understand the arguer really well, and if you take that too far, you can just kind of ignore their privacy, right? You kind of start trying to figure out where they might get this from, and so you inquire about how their mother treated them. Maybe that's not appropriate. Okay, so those are the advantages and risks of emic charity. So now let's talk about what that means for what we should do. At the moment, philosophy and structures teach the principle of charity as an uncontroversial norm that is relatively straightforward in critical thinking courses. I, I hope I have convinced you that it's not straightforward. Um, both emic and etic charity are tools for interpreting arguments that have advantages and disadvantages and most of the time in order to actually be charitable you need to use them both in succession, right? First the emic bit, then the attic bit. Um, first you understand how the arguer is seeing the world and then you try to understand how, how they see the world should impact your mind. But that's really hard and also sometimes you need a lot of emic charity first but then once you understand how they see the world you need to do almost nothing to see how this would relate to you. Sometimes it's the other way around. And sometimes, and this is important not to forget, charity is just not appropriate at all because it would mean silencing someone who tries to give an important criticism or because it would mean helping a really, really despicable worldview gain ground by treating them as if they were a real option. I don't want to encourage you to pick up Mein Kampf and say, let's interpret this charitably, says the German. I'm allowed to make those jokes. <laughs> right? Also, charity does not guarantee charitable success. Some arguments just can't be helped. Sometimes you do all of this and you're like, well, it's a bad argument, what can I do? But that doesn't mean that we should stop teaching the principle of charity. We should just keep, right, we should keep trying to be charitable with those we disagree with. But I don't think half a page is enough in a 500 page textbook. I think we should teach and remember two additional things, right? First, we should remember that there's a difference between emic and attic charity and the fact that often we need both in order to actually be charitable and not be mean and behind a nice smile. Right? If we conflate those, it makes it really easy 
to make ourselves feel good by thinking we were so charitable, but really to avoid having to confront anything uncomfortable. And second, we should keep in mind the kinds of reasons that speak for and against each to avoid the pitfalls that are involved. How we should use charity depends on what will most help us treat others with respect and identify the best reasons. And in the end, we have to do the work ourselves, like no critical think thinking textbook can give us one straightforward rule. Depending on context, that could require any combination of emic and etic charity, and sometimes it requires not to be charitable at all. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for going over time. Um, thank you so much. This session is recorded and will be available on SACPA's website, YouTube channel, and shown on Rogers TV community channel. Thank you so much to the U of L, Rogers TV for your valuable support, also to the Lethbridge Herald and any other media for your coverage. Um, I'm going to start the questions now. I'm going to be hovering in the back, but please, I encourage you to come stand up, ask your question, and Dr. Stevens will do their best to answer you with all of their incredible knowledge. Hi, my yeah. name. My na say your name. I forgot to say that. I was just going to do that. You're amazing. <laughs> my, my name is David Major. Um, it took me a long time to get my head around what you were saying, but I realized now that I have an important question that's not just you and I, it's group, two groups. And <clears throat> the background of this is I think there's a really serious divide between urban and rural, particularly as it relates to how we raise animals and that sort of thing. And so I'm wondering how you see a question like this where you've got a, a much greater portion of society, like 97%, let's say, feel a certain way, and then the small group that are feeding that 97% are living it, but there's a this big group who doesn't have any experience emically right. are trying to tell this group how they should do their job. And I'm wondering how a person should go about, like if I have an argument with my sister who lives in town, how do I, how do I deal with this? Because she has no experience with real animals and yet she's got a lot of opinions about it. So sorry for taking so long. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, think this is a, I think this is a really, really great question um, because it, it touches on something that argumentation theorists call a, a so-called deep disagreement. A deep disagreement is when you have a disagreement, right? A normal disagreement is you have a disagreement and you share all kinds of beliefs and so you can fix it really quickly. Like you're sitting in a car and you're like, we should take right because like that's the faster route. And then the other one says, no, we shouldn't. And you say, why? And they're like, because they started construction work there. And you're like, oh, okay. That's a simple, dis like you have a disagreement, you have all the reasons there, it's very easy. You understand each other perfectly. Um, but the kind of the arguments over how to raise animals when you have a city country divide and one person has just entirely different experiences and knowledge than the other person has, right? They are not these kinds of simple disagreements because they go really, really deep. There's lots and lots of beliefs that these people don't share. There's lots of knowledge that this person has that this person doesn't have access to. And that's exactly when you start needing charity. And I think that um, basically one can ask oneself, is it like, is this a good time to start arguing or should I tell my sister to come live with me for two weeks and then we'll have this argument, right? Because part of the question becomes, can I ask her to spend, like to, um, to use enough empathy and listen for long enough to actually understand what my life with animals is like, like what a cow is when you've got to live with it. And right, 
Um, can I explain this in words, or do I have to put her in a position where she experiences it for at least a while, and then I can start trying to explain it in words? And I think this is a kind of this is this is a picture that we have for many many problems, right? We like we tell people that they're wrong or that what they're doing is evil because we have absolutely no idea about in what context or under which experiences they've done this or why they have done this. And even after your sister, I can't see you, where did you go? Ah, oh, there. Right, even after your sister has had this experience, she might still think that, she, that you should treat the animals differently. But I kind of suspect that if she did, and now she understands how it is to live with an actual cow, <laughs> sorry, I just assumed, um, that then the way that she talks to you about it will be much different, because she understands better what the consequences would be of actually implementing the things she thinks you should do, and how hard it is, and what it costs, right? And so, um, I guess saying something like, look, you got to be charitable to me. You don't understand what my world is like, and you have to understand what my world is like, and then we can have this argument. I don't know if that works, because I don't know your sister. <laughs> but, it might, but, it might, but that would be kind of what this talk suggests would be necessary. I don't know if that's helpful. My name is uh, Knut Peterson. Thank you very much for coming back to SACPA. The last time you spoke at SACPA was uh, downstairs at the keg. <laughs> and you had slides. It was very small, and most people couldn't read them. But <laughs> you have done well to <laughs> pick up on that. And my question is very, very simple, actually. Uh, I don't argue that often, but when I do, it often ends up by me saying that, uh, can we just uh, agree to disagree? Is that uh, laziness or is that charitable? I don't know. It's not laziness and it's also not terrible. Um, and I think it's neither lazy nor terrible for two reasons. The first one is um, our minds, like they feel fast sometimes, but they're not fast. Right? So you, we often kind of think something like, okay, so I'm going to argue with this person for half an hour and then one, one of us has changed the worldview completely. Like, let's argue with someone who has a completely different opinion than me about some really deeply important topic that's all like embedded throughout their entire life and in half an hour will change their mind. No, you won't. Like, this is, that's not going to happen, right? What, ca what we, the most of, the, I mean, when it comes to arguments like, should I take the right or the left turn because there's construction, then you get a f results really quickly. But that's because those arguments are about things that where the kind of stakes are like this. The stakes are really low, our beliefs have just been formed, these get results really quickly. The moment it gets into things that are important to us, where the stakes are high, where the beliefs are embedded in all kinds of things that we do. Sometimes the beliefs are such that if we lose them, we'll lose friends, right? With those kinds of arguments, we shouldn't go into them expecting that we will change the other person's mind. We should go into them hoping that we will give them a reason that they hadn't thought of before and that might, over the course of the next 14 to 31 days, change a tiny bit of their mind. And then we can talk about it again, and maybe we are both a little bit different, and we'll find out, whoa, we actually went from here to there, and now we'll talk again, and maybe maybe it'll go again. The human mind just isn't fast, right? It's not fast in thinking through. You get a new reason. You're like, okay, what does that mean for me? Do I now have to break with my best friend? Do I have to get out of my church? Like all this stuff. And then your mind has to work through all of that before it can come to how it's going to build this in. So I think to say, look, let's agree to disagree for now. Let's just like step back, take two weeks, see where we are when we talk about this again. It's probably really the only way to make any progress when it comes to arguments that are this difficult. Sorry, thank you. Hi, my name is Henning Mundel. Ich denke, wir kommen aus dem selben Land. Yeah. So I want to talk about briefly about the limitations on the use of emic 
charity because I think it, uh, you may need to share this with Dr. Aslan, that uh, the, oh, she didn't tell her name, <laughs> Jody. Um, that uh, as long as the cultures are somewhat close, maybe it works. But I just want to give a very brief example of uh, when I worked in, in India, I worked with one tribe as farm manager, but we had, um, uh, a lady who wanted to come and came to study, and she was a dancer and anthropologist and wanted to study and immerse herself in the Toda life and find out about their life. Here is this young North American lady, and she, after some time being amongst the Todas in the Nilgiri Hills in South India, she was complaining, they're all looking at me, they're all staring at me. Here's this tall white lady and these tiny little black people, really, really dark skinned, and she wants to immerse herself in. It just may not work to do this emic thing, and maybe a, a different uh, a limitation to emic has to be uh, provided. The other thing is, maybe uh, Latin scholars can come up with two different words for the two different aspects of charity. Do you know any Latin scholars that I can ask for this? No, but I'm sure there are some. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll put, out an, I'll put out an ad in the newspaper. Um, <laughs> so I think this is, I think this is absolutely right. So there's, there, ha, there, are, there are and have to be limits to emic charity. First of all, to protect ourselves, right? To some degree, at, at some point, trying to be, to, trying to do emic charity with someone who's, trying to do emic charity with someone whose worldview is a little bit different from ours is relatively easy. So like, let's say I have a roommate and we're both in university and we're poor. And I'm like, let's just buy this coffee table from Facebook Marketplace. Look, there's $20 ones there. Like, we can't afford anything good. Let's just do that. And now my roommate is like, no, they're filthy. Right? I might be like, that's nonsense. <laughs> I, we can check it. But if I use Amic Charity and ask them about the background, it turns out, like, a year ago, they had a really bad case of bed bugs, and they're just terrified. And the filthy was like the code for, I'm afraid I'm going to bring bugs into the house. That's relatively easy, right? It does still require me to understand their worldview and, and all of that, but it's something that I have good access to. Trying to learn a different culture, right, especially if it's like radically different from the one that you've grown up into in order to deal with an argument can be painful both for you and for the people from the different culture because it can like Dislo dislocate you, right? Make you feel like you're not at home anywhere, make you question your most fundamental beliefs. And so sometimes you gotta ask, like, is this worth it or is the price too high? I think in, in a sense, even then it might be worthwhile to be aware that the choice for emic charity was there and that we chose not to engage in it because that means that we have to s look in the eye the fact that there is a point of view and that from that point of view there are reasons and these people aren't insane and they're not evil and I can't understand why they believe what they believe but there probably are reasons there and I should treat that with some respect right so even if it is even if we step back from emic charity because it's too much, because it costs too much from, of ourselves of, or of the person who we would be charitable to because we would have to inc like step over the lines of their privacy or rob them of their secrets, something like that. Even if we say we can't do this now, if we're aware that we have made that decision, we're more likely to treat them with respect because we now know there are reasons that I chose not to find out about if that makes sense. Like, there's not, not nothing there. It's just that I decided I shouldn't go there. I don't know if that helps. Oh, oh, a monster. <laughs> uh, my name is Donald Trump. I, I expect you didn't like the talk, sir. <laughs> um, but seriously, um, I, I'm fascinated by the great divide between Republicans and Democrats around uh, some of the issues of the election. And, um, and uh, it strikes me that, as I try to understand Republicans, uh, there are panels in the evening on CNN, for example, in which some of the Republican spokespeople are 
are fairly sensible people that you can respect, but they, there's this great divide. And I, 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 I suspect that one of the problems is that there's quite different facts uh, people are, wa are talking from. Uh, Republicans kind of discard Trump's rudeness and uh, criminality and several other things because something else is important to them. And I wonder how you can have a conversation with charity uh, without having some common facts or some common starting points. And do you, do you want to reflect about that in the light of uh, what we hear on between Republicans and the Democrats who often shout past each other vigorously and righteously because I think they have quite different facts they're talking from. Thank you, Mr. Trump. <laughs> that was a surprisingly reflective and carefully worded question. <laughs> um, so, first, so I think the first thing I want to say is I think that when we watch these kinds of debates that are on television, those people are usually not actually arguing with each other. They're each arguing to an audience, right? So they're not, they're not talking to each other. They're talking to an audience at each other. Um, so I'm not, so we can't expect, we, we, I mean, we can expect charity from them in that we can say you should be charitable, but we can't like believe that they will show each other charity because that will probably not go over well with the audience that they're trying to convince. And I'm not saying that this is just Republicans. I think this is just generally. And I think also that that's just something we as people tend to do. Like when, there's an, when you disagree with someone and there's a third person in the room, you're going to disagree differently than when you're together alone. Because it's less co when, you, when it's just the two of you, it's less costly to show vulnerability than if there's an audience who can see you be vulnerable. So I think, I think first of all, this is just the case. And second of all, it's very human. So it's not necessarily something we should be extremely angry or like disdainful for, at the, for because I mean, at least I know that when there's an audience, I behave different than when I'm alone with someone. So then we can kind of go and say, okay, so can we expect a Republican and a Democrat who are just argue, like who are just alone in a room together and arguing about some topic, can we expect them to be charitable? Can they be charitable with each other? And I think they can. Like the only thing that they have to have in common is they have to have in common that they think this sitting opposite me opposite me. This is a reasonable person who wants to get to what's right. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that sometimes either the Republican or the Democrat wouldn't be justified in not thinking that about the other. And when they're justified in not thinking that about the other, then maybe they shouldn't argue at all. Like, why would you argue with someone you think is just out to get you or out to fool you. But the moment that you think, no, no, this person means what they're saying and they really want to hear what I'm saying, then it becomes sensible to be like, okay, so I don't have to adopt their viewpoint, but I should understand it and I should see if there's anything in there that makes, that I should take on. I have a, um, I have a very good friend at the university whom I disagree with about a lot of things. She's not a Republican. <laughs> But, but we disagree really, really deeply. And we sometimes sit on my porch and drink maybe more than a glass of wine and just talk forever, disagreeing constantly. This is the best friendship I have in Lethbridge because I constantly learn how I'm wrong. I never end up saying, no, you're right, I'll adopt your point of view. But I learn how I'm wrong a little bit here or a little bit there. How like maybe there is a point to this that I have to integrate into my position as uncomfortable as it is. And then the position changes. It never changes to her position, but it does change. And I think um, one of the things that is so scary about the polarization that we're seeing between Republicans, Democrats, and all over the world is that people stop thinking there's, a, there's reasonableness on the other side. Like there's something to discover there. And I might never come to think that they're right. But if I discover what's to discover there, my position might become a little different. And if their position comes a little different too, we might be able to find some kind of compromise or some way to go forward without having to hit each other over the head or start the next civil war.
My name is Belinda Crows, and thank you very much for the presentation. I've been wondering as you've been talking how power imbalance plays into this, because charitable argument from one side could be seen as pandering, and from the other side it could almost be seen as expected. So how does power imbalance play into this sort of argument? Thank you. Uh, power imbalance messes it all up. <laughs> and it's everywhere, so it messes it all up all of the time. Thank you for asking the question I really hope no one would ask. <laughs> um, so, right, you're absolutely right, right? Um, remember when I said at some point that like demanding charity of someone who's objecting to something can be really morally harmful? It's even worse when it comes along a power imbalance, right? So like imagine you imagine you're a student and you walk into a professor's office and you start arguing with them and then they're like, you're interpreting me uncharitably. Like you're arguing about the way they treated you in class and you're like, you have to be more charitable. Or I'm, I say, you have to be more charitable. Well, this is highly unfair, right? Because I just, I'm just weaseling out of the responsibility of actually hearing them. So um, first of all, power imbalances can make the harm that you can do with the wrong kind of charity or by demanding charity in the wrong, at the wrong time, they can make that harm way, way worse. Like you can silence people that are not powerful by claiming that they're not being charitable because now if they keep talking, they're going to look like they're being mean when really the person who's being mean is me. Um, right? So. There, the dangers that come with demanding charity and the dangers that come with toxic charity are much, much bigger when it comes to power imbalances, right? The same comes when you kind of imagine that the person who's misinterpreting the duck rabbit argument, like they're the one with the buying power. You can kind of immediately see that the toxic charity is much more impactful than if there's no power imbalance. So yeah, power imbalances play a huge role. And one of our responsibilities when we argue with someone is to be really, really realistic about whether we might be the one with more power and therefore have more responsibility to try and make sure that the other person gets a voice. And it's, um, it's kind of important to always remember that we often really underestimate how much power we have, right? It's very easy to say, oh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the victim here. I'm the one with less power, so I can behave however I want. But there are many, many different ways that you can have power. You can have power because of your social position, because of your institutional position. You can also have power because you have the better exit options. When I argue an exit option is you can, you're the one who can deal better with it if the whole thing breaks down. When I argue with my husband over who has to do the dishes, he always has more power because he can live for three weeks with undone dishes. <laughs> so if the argue, so I, I cannot allow the argument to break down, but he can, right? So even though I admit that maybe I'm the one with more power generally in the relationship, when it comes to dishes, he's the one with more power, if that makes sense. So like it's, it is very important to kind of keep in mind, am I, could I be the one who has more power right now and therefore should work harder at making this something where everybody has a voice, if that makes sense? Last week, I, I suggest, I'm Bev from Atherstone. Last week, I suggested people might dress up for Halloween. So some of us have. So you don't always carry a cap? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So um, it seems I'm here specifically because I want to hear you. So I am representing Emic Charity, because I want to hear you and understand your point of view. And um, I'm, I want you to understand my point of view, because I'm going to tell you I have two comments and one question. So now I'm asking it to be reversed. Um, one comment is, I think whenever we go to listen to a speaker, we have emic charity, unless we're going to listen to the speaker to uh, throw tomatoes. Then we're in etic charity. Am I right? Usually. Yes, usually. Okay. I'm just trying to understand it. Um, one thing that I found really fascinating was the idea of being the bystander, watching two people arguing, hearing the first one, believing 
from my perspective, per perception that I understood the first person. The second person seems to be just way out there. And I jump in to tell the second person, you're off base. But then I feel really bad because I like the first person. So I think you've clarified that, uh, explaining how then we feel uncharitable towards the first person, even though we feel the second person uh, was was off base. So thank you for that. Now, now I understand. I'm going to. I think I'll apologize to uh, to the speaker and uh, as well as the other one, or maybe I'll just shut up. But I'm not sure about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> if it's possible. Okay, so my question is this, and it kind of goes along with what uh, Mr. Trump said. Um, <laughs> and, astonishing how Trump has such good things to say. Yes, it's very, it's very good. Okay, so I don't think it's just Trump. I think it's um, in any of these situations where we have arguments between not just two people but two political parties. And um, I think that we, that we have... Um, perhaps false or pseudo emics em, em, yeah. yeah, um, such as when um, Pierre Poliev says um, that he wants, if he gets in, he will increase the, um, the GST rebate to um, people who, who buy new homes for a million dollars. But he's not indicating that Actually, under Trudeau, it, it, Trudeau came up with the idea of um, of giving the GST rebate to people with five hundred thousand dollar houses. So I think that's um, disingenuous, emic, because he's taking, he's pretending that he's that he's. Um, he's, he's listening to what what Trudeau said, but then he's he's pretending like he didn't hear it. So I think it's disingenuous. Maybe I've mixed that up. Um, so I'm kind of wondering what happens when we have people like the, uh, the debate in the US where one person is, is, says something, the other person responds but takes what the first person has said and twists it. So it sounds like emic, like they're actually listening but then they twist it so it becomes etic. So can we have emic and etic at the same time? Just be very quick. Okay. Very quick? Okay, yes, we have like 30 seconds. I have, like, I have a very long answer. Um, okay, I think, so um, I, have to, I have to kind of pick out of all the things I thought were important to say about this one thing and that will make for like an only mediocre answer, so I'm sorry. I think it's a, it's a very interesting and important question. And, and the one thing that I think that you put your finger on and that I would like, and that I also just would like to end this whole thing with because I think it's a really good take home message is that anything a critical thinking textbook teaches you and anything an argumentation theorist might tell you about good arguing, if you want to turn it around and use it as a weapon, you can. Like, human minds are extremely good at weaponizing literally anything, right? And so sometimes you will see this, exactly what you're describing, right? Someone um, is like, okay, so I've been told that I should be charitable and so I'm going to put up a good face that looks exactly like charity, but I'll twist it just a little bit so that I get my thing in after all. This is possible with anything, right? This is in argumentation you can take, when we teach, sorry, when we teach students the fallacies, we tell them you shouldn't do ad hominems, and an ad hominem is when you attack the person instead of the claim. And then they turn around, they're like, wow, I just learned how to like call things ad hominem so that the person can't criticize me anymore. And you're like, no, no, that's not. <laughs> Wait, no, you're not supposed to weaponize it. But you can. And what you described was basically 
uh, or what you, I think what you asked about was like, could I weaponize this or do people weaponize this? And the answer is yes. Yes, they do. They weaponize charity, they weaponize the fallacies, they weaponize any rule that anyone comes up with about how to communicate morally. They will turn any, someone is going to be like, wow, this is a powerful tool. I can hit someone over the head with it. And they will. Um, so the, so the only thing I can say to that is like, don't. Don't hit anyone over the head with it, right? Turn the weapon against yourself. Don't turn it against other people, right? Try, that's why I had this at some point on the slide, like use charity so that you get knowledge and insight and treat others well. And that's just our responsibility to always make sure that we do that. And that responsibility cannot be lifted off our shoulders by any rule in any critical thinking textbook. Any rule in any critical thinking textbook has a sharp edge, and any sharp edge can be used to hurt someone. You can, like, please no one take this away as, oh, this, I never thought of this. I will now read critical thinking textbooks to defeat my enemies. Like, please just don't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Reminder, there's still an opportunity to get a membership from SACPA, membership from the LSEO. They have provided us this room free of charge. Another round, thank you so much. Let's all treat each other with kindness as we go on. Um, I just wanted to let you know next week, November 7th, we have What's the Deal? The Primary Care Access Crisis and Integrating Nurse Practitioners um, with Christiane Etzenberger. So I hope to see you all there to listen and practice some kindness. Thank you so much. Have a great Halloween. Stay safe, everyone.